going live we're live <laughs> here we are live on this uh 15th of june is it now uh sharing shakespeare number three i believe officially and uh my name is jamie i'm one of the wet mariners and uh i'm joined today by someone who many of you will recognize some of you may not but this is uh gavin hooson um i just need to uh, uh i've got uh, an echo happening. I need to turn that off. There we are. Always a technical issue. Um, so here we are with Gavin Hooson, who um, is uh, uh, on the board of trustees for the Willow Globe, I believe, and Shakespeare Link. Mm -hmm. And Gavin started off, um, well, not started off, the, there was a period before university, but he, uh, he studied history at university before briefly becoming an archaeologist and then uh, working in uh, several libraries in Powys and work in the archives there and has a keen sense of history one might say and gav is here so. to, <laughs> to talk to us about um kind of the historical context of a lot of shakespeare's plays with a particular focus um probably on cymbeline um so uh let's get stuck in if um anyone has any questions there's a little youtube uh, question and answers Kind of chat thing going on we'll keep an eye on that and uh we'll we'll include you as much as we can um but uh let's let's just have a chat gav shall we right yeah how are you doing oh okay yeah um my, i live close enough to the border that we can sneak into england which <laughs> is a, a little, little bit more opened up so we occasionally do sneak across the border you know. <laughs> That's well, things like dog grooming uh, <laughs> and uh, <Amazing. laughs> take away coffee, things like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so aside from dog grooming, um, one thing I think just to start the conversation is uh, mm. if we're taking Cymbeline as our sort of case study play, but feel free to talk about yeah. any other of Shakespeare work, Shakespeare's work. Um, there's sort of three timelines at play when we watch a Shakespeare play. We've got, we've got the, um, the time that we live in now, uh, we've got the, the time that the play was written in and then the time that it was set in. So we'll talk about Cymbeline. Um, what are those three timelines looking like in terms of kind of uh, the historical context that the story is told in? Absolutely. Well, um, it's set, uh, Cymbeline is set, um, probably something like the first or second decade AD. Um, he specifically mentions it's after Caesar's raids, which are in the mid 50s uh, BC, and it's after the wars of uh, Cunobelin, uh, who the Latin sources all call Cunobelinus. So, I think we we lost you there, Gav. I can't hear you. Um, is that my Zoom or yours? Oh, we've lost Gav. Are you there, Gav? <laughs> Apologies, this is inevitable. Um, <laughs> just as we're about to get stuck in, the internet is having a, a fun old time with us. Um, but that's a lovely image that Gav has frozen up. <laughs> um, apologies for this, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, um, we have frozen Gav. <laughs> um, just enjoy the uh, still image. Nice picture of Frida Kahlo. Okay, um, let's uh, let's see what happens. Well, let's get him invited again. He's got the link. <laughs> Hope everyone's well. <laughs> Let's see where Gav is. This is inevitable when uh, you're relying on technology like this um, uh, across geographical limitations. But it is what it is. Just a brief moment, we'll, uh, we'll try and uh -huh. try. Here he is, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, inevitable. Uh, 
<laughs> Inevitable. Yeah. Inevitable. What was the pearl of wisdom you were about to? You were talking about um, Caesar's raids just finished. Yeah, Caesar's raids, uh, the wars of Cunobelinus, uh, Cunobelin, as he calls him in the in the play, Cymbeline. Um, they they're in the past, so it's probably um, first couple of decades somewhere there, AD. Um, the play Cymbeline was written. I'm pretty sure. It was the play um, he wrote after he wrote Pericles, which for us in the Willow Globe uh, Theatre Company, um, that was the play we did last. Um, <laughs> Co-written with a brothel keeper, I seem to remember. Um, so it's towards the end of, uh, we're in, well into the Jacobean period, towards the end of uh, Shakespeare's career. Um, so yeah, and then of course, uh, how does it? All our all Shakespeare's plays end up being about us in some way, don't they? I know mm. everybody says that, but they just do. You you always end up at some point thinking, "Good God, that's us!" You know, at some point it, um, in a play. So that's as you rightly say, that's the sort of three um, flexible timelines that we're dealing with. Um, in um, Cymbeline. Hmm. Um, so for Shakespeare's contemporary audience, it's very much a place set quite distantly in the past. Very much them. so, yeah. And what was what would have been their understanding of what that world looked like? Um, very little, really. Um, some people would have uh, read um, Caesar's De Bello Gallica, which was his um, work of self-aggrandizement, bigging himself up big time. <laughs> uh, look at me, look how clever I was. Um, so uh, to be fair, an awful lot of what we know about um, Iron Age Britain comes from Caesar, but we have to take it with a pinch of salt because, uh, as I say, it was um, bigging himself up. Um, he says when he came here, uh, he just came to raid. He wasn't trying to invade, and he, he makes a, a strong point of that. But we've only got his word for it. Mm. Um, he tells us about um, the Celtic tribes and their druids and their uh, penchant for uh, human sacrifice. But again, uh, he's trying to big himself up and, and trying to um, show how barbarous um, the British... Uh, tribes were but this is from a man who's just committed genocide in Gaul uh, you know a third of the population slaughtered a third taken away in, into slavery elsewhere in the Roman Empire and the population of Gaul is only a third the size it was uh, so we, we should take all of that with a huge pinch of salt really um, it's quite possible of course that they, the Celts did have uh, human sacrifices, um, but no one's ever found the um, archaeological remains of a wicker man, for example. Um, so we we simply don't know. Um, Iron Age. I don't think Shakespeare's audience would have known too much. The groundlings probably didn't know an awful lot about it. They'll have seen stone circles occasionally up and down the country and. Uh, talk of druids and things like this, but I'm sure they only had a very hazy uh, idea. Mm. Um, those who uh, had a classical education uh, would have had a bit better idea, but again, only from classical sources. So, um, again, pinch of salt, really. Um, I, I guess it's all, you know, literally the mists of time. Mm. Um, so would, would the knowledge of these this world that Cymbeline set in, would that have been passed on um, more as kind of a national mythology? Yes, I think so. I think so. Um, and, and to be fair, in England, there would have been a fair amount of dismissing of um, uh, the pre-Roman uh, inhabitants of these islands because um, English historians have always felt well the celtic peoples who lived in these islands aren't us they're nothing to do with us 
Uh, and so even right up to when I was at uh, school, um, we were always invited to um, admire the Roman uh, inhabitants of Roman Britain and mm. denigrate the and, and share how uh, inferior the Celtic Iron Age peoples were. Um, but that's, first of all, that's not true because we now know that um, uh, our Celtic ancestors are just that. that. Even if you're English, you have Celtic ancestry. Um, they weren't driven out. Uh, mm. It was simply intermarriage. Uh, and now we also have a better understanding through archaeology of um, the peoples of these islands in the Iron Age and uh, their worldview. So it wasn't a matter, however much we like underfloor central heating, uh, it wasn't a matter of cure, you know, the, the Iron Age Celts couldn't even build central heating. Yeah. It's more a matter of a, an entirely different worldview. Mm. Um, and you have to see it in that light. Uh, yes, of course, you know, Roman engineering was brilliant. And we all like a good aqueduct. And we like uh, underfloor central heating and we like a nice villa. Um, but even in Roman Britain, very few people lived that level of uh, sophistication. Um, mm. For most of the inhabitants uh, who were here in the Iron Age, um, Roman Britain didn't make an enormous difference for them. Um, yeah. They still worked the fields as they always had. Uh, they worked on estates that were still looked after by the tribal aristocracy. Uh, owned by them, so life in the outside the towns for the sort of peasant majority wouldn't have been that different. Mm. Um, in in the urban centres, yes, it, of course it would have been different. Um, but I think um, when you uh, we need to look at the Iron Age uh, tribal Celtic Britain in its own right and not in comparison with. Um, because I don't, I don't think that's a, a reasonable way of doing it, and you'll end up with a warped, a warped idea. Um, yes, Roman engineering uh, was superior, but um, the Iron Age Celts who lived here uh, were much more in touch uh, with the landscape, and um, although Roman engineering was superior, rural engineering. I would argue is superior in Iron Age Celtic Britain. Um, there's a a farm at a place called Butza. It's an experimental archaeology uh, station on the South Downs, and um, they rebuild houses from all sorts of digs all over Britain, uh, exactly as they would have been. So they they start with the archaeology and they build the house exactly as it was. And they had an experiment to farm some fields in exactly the way the Iron Age tribesmen would have done it, uh, using the plough, using as near as possible the sort of um, uh, M of wheat, which was as near as we can get to the sort of cereal crops that they grew, uh, and then harvesting it in the way the Iron Age tribes would have done it, uh, and then storing the grain uh, in that way and they produced a crop yield per acre that wasn't to be matched in in Britain till the First World War so um, it, it in some ways um, the Celts were perfectly in tune with their environment and were very good at exploiting that environment mm -hmm. um, they weren't interested in in urban uh, life at all markets of course and get-togethers, um, certainly, um, but they, they weren't really interested in urban development. Whether they would have been in the fullness of time if, if Rome hadn't interfered, who knows? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think there's, there's an interesting thing where um, the, the, the Roman element is, it seems to dominate the story in terms of the, the history of Britain, and I wonder whether how comfortably um, Shakespeare's contemporaries would have sat with being descendants of Celts rather than descendants of the classical civilization of Rome. Yes, and I, I, I think um, 
they regarded themselves as descendants of the Anglo-Saxons. And I think they would have simply said, oh, these people have nothing to do with us. Right. Colourful as, uh, as the setting is, uh, I suppose they would, they would um, perhaps in Cymbeline identify with the British resistance to Rome and um, Bellarius and uh, his two foster sons and, mm -hmm. and you know, seen, identified in that way. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think they would have seen uh, these inhabitants as being anything to do with them directly um they're wrong we know now but they didn't know yeah. then. that's um th we've got a question actually that was set uh, sent in from mm. helen street um she's she asks why do you think shakespeare made use of wales as a setting for part of cymbeline and what importance did milford haven have in shakespeare's time um i think he chose wales because one of the major themes in the play is um, the great difference between the poisonous world of all courts, whether Roman, whether it's Cymbeline's court, uh, and the sort of poison and backstabbing and intrigue that goes on there, and the much more innocent, close to nature world um, that of Bellarius, who lives in a cave, of course, mm. with his two uh, uh, foster sons. But um, so I think that's why he chose Wales. I think he probably saw that as being somehow closer to nature. Haverford West, I'm sure he simply chose because it's got an English name he could pronounce. Uh, I think if, if you think of the maps that would have been available to him, um, I think John Speed's maps were just coming out at this time, so he, he, he may not have seen them. But early English cartographers make a right of uh, the long Welsh names uh, and produce really garbled results. But the thing about Milford Haven is um, it's in an area that was ethnically cleansed of the native population uh, in the medieval period by their marcher lordships. So they, they pushed out the native Welsh and invited in um, English and Flemings. Um, and that's why um, southern... Pembrokeshire is always called the Little England Beyond Wales. So I'm sure he just looked at the map and thought, ah, oh, Haverford West, uh, Milford Haven. I can say those. <laughs> and I think it's simply that. I mean, Haverford West is a, a beautiful sheltered harbour, uh, twice sheltered. That it's an inlet onto an inlet onto the sea. Um, but there's plenty of harbours like that. I'm sure it's just that you could pronounce it as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and and to to a uh, to the London audience, um, I don't mean this geographically, but how far away did Wales feel to oh, them? A, a, an enormous distance, I'm sure. Even though um, they had a, a, they'd grown up with the Tudor dynasty, um, the Tudor dynasty did give um, legal an equal legal footing um, to the people of Wales, but on a purely English uh, basis. So um, at, at the Act of Union, well, people in Wales were given equal legal status with the people in England, uh, but the official language uh, of the official life of Wales was English from that point on, uh, not Welsh. So even though there were plenty of uh, Welsh people like Cecil, for example, um, that's originally Sacist, um, as Welsh as it comes, but uh, they were part of the English court and the, the language and culture of the English court, even in a Tudor dynasty, was English. Um, so I'm sure for, for Shakespeare, Wales was, you know, uh, uh, long ago and far away, um, and, but in a colourful sort of way, so that, you know, uh, they imagined it as a land of mists and wild men and forests and what have you and, and they're right of course <laughs> I, I think there's an interesting thing where i'm probably projecting a little bit here but shakespeare uh, as a man is he's he's his country and city you've got that duality there yeah. and there's an interesting parallel between the celts and the romans and that actually 
in Shakespeare's lifetime, there was a huge mass migration to the cities and you've got this clash between the rural and the urban and that being quite live and it, it would have been present in Shakespeare's audience. And I, I just wonder whether that feeds in from the play. Possibly. Um, yeah, I, I think so. But at the same time, London is always uh, outside that in a way. London is always a special case, isn't it? Mm. You know, um, it's always far bigger than anywhere else. Um, even when there are other big cities like Norwich and, and Bristol and what have you, London is always so much bigger, uh, an important port, the biggest port. Um, so London is always a, a kind of special case. But, but you're absolutely right that um, um, Shakespeare makes more of uh, actually um, the, the space between the natural world and people living close to nature and the difference between that and the poisonous world of courts that he does actually between Rome and uh, the you know uh, Wales, um, Rome and um, Celtic Britain. Mm. Um, so I, I think he's um, Wales has always been fairly sparsely populated. So I, I can imagine you know. Um, they would think uh, to, to the London audience, they would, th you know, this would seem romantically far away and mm. uh, far off and closer to nature. Um, that may not be the case in his day, but um, yeah, he's chosen a good place to emphasize that, you know, with Bellarius and his foster sons living in a cave, uh, it's much easier to see that um, they really are close to nature hunting um, and, you know, in a mountain landscape with mm. great valleys and forests and what have you. And would that be, is that perhaps a clue to how Shakespeare, his connection to the Celts and, and Shakespeare's audience connection to the Celt, is that, is that something that the, the, the national character has inherited in terms of the mythology of nature, that connection to the land? I think so. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, it, it may not necessarily be true. I mean, I, I can't imagine in uh, even in um, Anglo-Saxon times that, you know, life would have been that different in the north of England or in, in the middle of Wales, uh, mm. you know, uh, really. But it's I think it's, it's uh, people in England have always had this sort of slightly romantic and patronising idea <laughs> of, uh, you know, of what, uh, Wales is like really. Mm. Uh, we're, we are, of course, all good singers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the land of song, etc. Um, but of course, the other things that uh, come out in in Celtic society in the Iron Age, in the time Cymbeline is set, uh, there were great differences. Like I'm thinking on um, the royal houses of the tribes of um, of Britain at that time uh, were matrilinear. So uh, uh, if a king uh, and a queen um, had a, a son as their eldest child, he would not inherit the crown. Uh, the man who married their eldest daughter would inherit the crown and the two of them would rule together. So the royal blood came down through the daughters and, and that matrilinear uh, line. And I think it's safe to assume from that that women in Iron Age society probably, and we can't be certain, probably um, had a much bigger role um, and certainly not the role that um, women in Shakespeare's own time uh, mm. would have had, which was uh, well, very little regard for, really. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, Shakespeare doesn't actually make anything of that. He may not have even known it, but, mm. uh, um, you know, uh, the court of King Cymbeline um, is not like that at all. Um, and in, in a way, the world of uh, Britain in, in the play Cymbeline um, doesn't owe a great deal, doesn't reflect a great deal of what we now know about Iron Age society. But that doesn't mean um, you can't bring these themes into the play. Um, 
I think particularly of um, the visual aspects of it. Um, right. we, we know a lot about the, uh, the artwork and the iconography of uh, the Iron Age tribes through things like um, the Uffington White Horse, that giant oh. chalk figure uh, cut into the South Downs. Uh, and that's the kind of stylized animal shapes. There we are. That, I mean, it isn't is. that amazing? That's yeah. just astonishing. Uh, and again, you can see, to me, it's, I know some people say, well, maybe it's a dragon. Can't see that myself, but I can see a horse there, all right, despite the strange looking head. But that's yeah. a very stylized, exaggerated sort of uh, animal shape that, uh, that you've got in Celtic art. And visual aspects like that you can bring into to perhaps exaggerate the, the difference in the play between uh, Cymbeline's world and the classical Roman world. There's, there's something interesting where it's, it's it's not meant to be a naturalistic horse, exactly. But it, it's got an exactly. essence. There's a movement. Yes. There's there's exactly. different elements at play. Yeah, absolutely. That's. I mean, look at those back legs. That's a horse's back legs, for goodness' sake. Yeah. You know, just a couple of lines, and it's you've got it. There it is. Um, there's, a, there's a movement to it. There's absolutely. there's perspective in the, yep. the kind of the muscularity of the back legs and the thin. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been suggested it might be in honour of the horse goddess, uh, the Celtic horse goddess Epona. Who knows? We certainly don't. But uh, um, we're very lucky also in an awful lot of artwork, uh, Celtic artwork, um, was uh, thrown into streams and springs and rivers. And this is because this is how you... Um, sent offerings to um well these spaces were liminal spaces so um when you lowered uh, an object into the water you were sending it into the world of the spirits the world of the gods and the world where your ancestors were and you would end up going there too so um the famous battersea shield for example um, that hasn't, it isn't animal shape, but it's got, look at that, it's got those amazing fluid lines that was dropped into the River Thames at Battersea, hence its name. And again, it's, although it isn't animal shaped, it's got those incredible fluid lines. And probably that shield, a very high status object, was probably made just to be given to the river. Probably never used. It certainly hasn't been in battle anyway. Um, and, of course, we're very lucky to have these objects because uh, if they're made of bronze, uh, if they're made of gold, they don't rust. Um, and uh, it, uh, even ironwork dropped into the water, although it does rust, it doesn't rust through anaero uh, because it's in anaerobic conditions. Um, you still end up with um, beautiful shapes. So, so Right back from the Bronze Age times, there are all sorts of swords and daggers and beautiful artifacts um, dropped into uh, streams and wells. Uh, um, so, yeah. And, and finally, one other uh, animal shape, uh, of course, which, again, we can, we can utilise to accentuate the differences, is the magical... Celtic warhorn, the carnyx, which again is an exaggerated animal shape. Um, here, here they are. Yeah, amazing. Now, only a handful of people in Britain have ever blown one of these, but you, Jamie Wilkes, are <laughs> one of them. Yeah, you can, I, probably, I... you can probably count the number of people who've blown one of these on one <laughs> hand. Yeah, we so, had one in Titus Andronicus. Um, it was really? very similar to this this one here. Yeah, um, which we used to represent the uh, uh, in in the hunt. Yeah. And uh, I went through the crowd of groundling, groundlings and tried not to hit them on the head. It, very um, top heavy. Oh, incredible! I, I had to have a. I think I had a, something around my waist. Yeah. to hold it in. Yeah, but um, kind of running with it. I had to do acrobatics with it and everything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. again, it's that 
amazingly stylized uh, animal shape, in this case, a wild boar. And some of them seem to have had a leather tongue inside. Yeah. And it makes the most unholy racket, weird, strange, mm. more like an animal sort of sound. Can you imagine uh, the Roman soldiers arriving here and hearing that coming out of the primeval forest? Yeah. My word. But that's uh, also, how they would have got that magical reputation, I imagine. Yes, I think there. so. Yeah, I think so. Um, also, of course, when, when Caesar arrived uh, with his legions on his raids in the mid-50s BC, they were shocked to find chariots. Uh, nobody else in Britain used chariots, uh, sorry, in Europe used chariots anymore. So the, the sort of well-educated prefects of the Roman legions must have thought, my God, we're on, we're on the plane before Troy again. Uh, no one had seen that for a long, long time. Um, but uh, in Yorkshire in particular, uh, chieftains, very high status people, probably royal members of the royal family, uh, were buried with their chariots and their chariot horses. And there were all these chariot burials. Uh, and you can even work out um, on some hill forts, if you did really carefully, you can work out the axle length of the Celtic chariot from the marks in the, in the ground at the Iron Age ground level. So you can even work out the sort of chariot uh, length. And so uh, on YouTube, you'll find various reconstructions of these amazing um, Iron Age chariots. Uh, yeah, so we could certainly then, thinking of the visual aspects, you can certainly use, yeah. uh, use these, this amazing Celtic artwork to emphasize um, the difference that this isn't classical world, this is something very different, a very different world view. Um, there, so, there's yeah. a, a question which kind of comes off nicely mm. uh, from the, the talk of the imagery that the Celts were using uh, from Randall Martin, who says, um, did the Welsh, like many indigenous peoples around the world, believe that human and animal spirits crossed over and communicated with one another? Possibly, yes. I mean, we've never act Absolutely no, because um, although Caesar says that the Druids um, wrote down their own language, you know, a sort of proto-Welsh, um, but with the Greek alphabet, he says that, and they may well have done, but we never found any. Uh, no one's ever come across it. So um, it's, it's a case of huh, weighing up things like the folk tales which survive from Celtic society in Ireland. But of course, those are probably a few centuries later um, and they may represent a kind of heroic uh, Celtic society where um, the leader in battle gets the hero's portion, um, you know, of the, the, the big feast afterwards. Uh, and and um, Bellarius in, in Cymbeline does mention that, doesn't he? You, mm. He doesn't call it the hero's portion, but he calls it something very similar. Um, so, yeah, you in, in Irish folk tales, I'm thinking of the, um, the Ulster cycle and, and uh, Finn McCool and, and the folk tales of Cahoolin. Uh, they do, I think, reasonably accurately uh, reflect that um, early heroic, society it's quite possible um that druids um would take uh hallucinogenic genic drugs to try and get in touch with the world of particularly animal spirits uh, but it's difficult to really know certainly from earlier in the bronze age and the neolithic uh, you do find uh, deer skeletons pierced with eye holes so that you you wear instead of the, what, what would be the top of the deer uh, becomes a mask right. with eye holes and it's thought that uh, shamans uh, would have worn those you know uh, to get in touch with the spirit of the animal but it's very hard to say really um, the truth is we, we know so little um, I, I think it likely 
but we just don't know, do we? I mean, it's, there's little inklings that survive. For example, the Abbots Bromley uh, Morris men, they dance with stag antlers and they dance uh, with those and the local Staffordshire coat of arms has a stag's head with a, a metal band around its neck, which is thought to mean shape-shifting. Uh, the the Abbots Bromley uh, dancers have allowed uh, dendro, uh, sorry, carbon fourteen dating on their um, stags' antlers, and I think it came out at ninth century. Wow. And so these are ancient, ancient artifacts. So there are little clues. Um, we know, you know, about the great fire festivals at Beltane sewing things like that um but there's an awful lot we still don't know yeah I, I i suspect it is quite likely that they would uh the druids would try uh that you know getting in touch with um again it's very difficult to know yeah and were they an animist culture then yes they were but in a way so is so is the classical Roman culture. You know, when, when you think the most common inscription found on votive uh, offerings uh, anywhere in the Roman Empire, including Britain, begins Genius Loki to the spirits of this place. And that's, right. you know, so um, yes, I think, I think both the religions, we, we tend not to think of the classical uh, world as, as being animist, but it is really. You know, with its uh, tree sprites and um, you know um, uh, stream sprites and and various other uh, yeah. So I, I think in that sense, yes, yes, both are animist. But um, quite how um, that works in both cultures? How how when you've got a pantheon of gods, how does that relate to uh, local? spirits of the local stream and the springs mm -hmm. and things like that um uh, quite difficult to know uh, we have a better clearer idea because of classical uh scholars studying you know um mm -hmm. uh, the classics but uh for in british culture i mean there's a there's a stream uh, a church near me uh where the battle of pillar was uh in radnorshire here uh where glindur fought his greatest victory but the church is in a weird spot it's halfway up a hill but when you go around the back of the church there is a medieval celtic well which is very obviously much older it's iron age and and the church is is not there because a saint lived there the church is there because there was already a well that local people regarded as holy which mm. may well be iron age who knows um so, you know, we mustn't assume if there's Christian artifacts that that represents some kind of cutoff, not at all. Um, mm. You know, there's, there's a certain amount of overlap going on in, in these spaces. I, I think, think how many churches are built uh, right next to a yew tree that's 3,000 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, a sort of spiritual continuity. I think that's a really important thing to remember when, especially when we're dealing with a historical play that's yeah. in a historical setting, um, uh, thinking about history rather than a linear A to B, it's actually about layers. And so much we understand of kind of certainly Christian cultures being layered on top of pagan cultures and Romans just building on top of things. And sometimes things peep through. And so although Shakespeare may not have understood the Iron Age kind of things that were peeping through. They may have been so strong through the culture that they uh, are informing all of his plays, the relationship, relationships with um, the, the natural world, Midsummer Night's Dream, if we think of all those fairies, and that, that yeah. that's a very um, ancient mythological uh, inheritance there. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean... Uh... Uh, some of these strange sort of sprite-like figures might be called Queen Mab, they might be called Puck, but actually that's simply a modern name tacked onto something that's a good thousand years older at mm. least uh, and goes right back to 
um, superstitions relating to Celtic inhabitants, to Saxon inhabitants. And these, these are common to people who live close to nature anyway, aren't they? So, you, you know, you, you, you only need to think of things like um, if we say someone's had a stroke, that was originally an elf stroke. You were, str you were struck right. down by, uh, you know, uh, spirits that you were, you know, you were a victim of, of supernatural beings. Mm. Um, so that's what it comes from. So these are, you know, superstitions. And in, in a way, it doesn't matter whether your society is Celtic or Anglo-Saxon or both. Um, really, these are fairly common superstitions that you, yeah. when things go wrong, you don't know why they've gone wrong. If your harvest is bad or what have you, um, you, you may not know that there's been a volcano in Iceland. Uh, <laughs> so you're likely to blame it on, uh, you know, oh, it's the spirits. We, we haven't, uh, we have, we failed in our libation to the spirits or whatever. Mm. Um, and I'm sure, you know, people in Warwickshire, in the villages around Stratford would, would still do that mm. in Shakespeare's day, I'm sure. When the absence of science, lots yeah. of things look very weird. Yeah. <laughs> a thunderstorm is a terrifying I thing if you don't understand that what it is. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from um, uh, Richard Rathbone, who asks, um, are the very varied sources for this odd play, Geoffrey of Monmouth via Hollinshead, for the history um, plot from the Boccaccio and bits and buffs from another play, Rare Triumphs of Love and Fortune, attributed to Thomas Kidd. Clues to Shakespeare's working methods. Some stuff he read, some stuff he'd been told about, some stuff he'd been performed, um, he'd seen performed, and of which maybe he had seen some of the actors' texts. When drafting, do you think he used notes or had relevant bound volumes to hand? Or like a good actor, did he have a prodigious memory? I, I think all of the above. Uh, really? Yes. Uh, well, we've got this strange idea about genius at work uh, from the 19th century, probably the Romantic poets onwards. Um, there's an amazing poem by Yeats, uh, and he, I can't remember what it's called, uh, I think it's just called The Long-Legged Fly, and it's a portrait of genius at work, three portraits. I think it's Helen of Troy, uh, Caesar, and Michelangelo, and, and these little portraits of genius at work, and each portrait has got um, a refrain at the end, which goes, uh, like a long-legged fly upon the stream, his mind moves on silence, which is an amazing image. But um, I don't think Shakespeare, you know, in working in the theatre was like that at all. Uh, I think in a way, um, I'm sure, you know, he liked quiet time in his, in his garret in Silver Street. I'm sure he did. Um, but I, I bet you anything, he spent a lot of time doing rewrites in the hubbub of the theatre with, you know, rehearsals going on around him and he'd just try and find a quiet corner. Um, he certainly uh, nicked from other plays. Uh, he certainly went back to core sources. Um, he may not have had books of his own but I'm sure he had um, sponsors who would make their libraries available to him. I'm thinking of Henry Risley, the Earl of Southampton, who he was friendly with for a while and of course they, his company were the Lord Chamberlain's men mm. uh, so he may well have had access to rich men's libraries. Um, I know it's, it's a bit weird um, when he, he dies he doesn't leave a single book in his will which is a bit weird for uh, for us, but on the other hand, you know, the wheeler dealer of Stratford and the great poet and playwright of London are the same men at the same time. Mm. So I think, I think this idea is of, of sort of the white heat of genius working alone uh, is unrealistic, really. And, mm. and um, he's a great poet. You know, and, and the language is better for the, all the words he gave us in so many ways. Um, a great playwright. But uh, we mustn't think that he's some rarefied creature, you know, that uh, uh, he would nick ideas from other plays. I mean, mm. we, I was thinking today of 
uh, I was reading about all the, all the plays that were performed uh, and have been uh, have survived only as titles in the Lord Chamberlain's uh, records, and we don't have the texts of any of these. Yeah. Uh, but but from the titles alone, you know several of the characters uh, appear in later Shakespeare plays, and it may well be that you know when he started out as an actor, he would play in a play. Um, and would think, oh, God, I could do it better than this. And so he yeah. would do that. He would nick the idea, yeah. you know, go back to other sources um, and write his own version, which would be better. Um, and, and I wonder where, if there's an element of, I, I imagine most people haven't read a book about frontier America, but they could have a good crack at writing a, a Western, that where you've got these genre pieces where there's an inherited idea of these, this is the history of, of this period, let's just put some characters in there and we can fill in the gaps based on what is the assumed knowledge that it's not necessarily from research, it's yeah. just this is how things are. Absolutely. I mean, think how many plays he wrote where um, he starts out with a particular setting, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, um, Much Ado About Nothing, uh, and you think, oh, we're, we're outside Athens or... Yeah. Uh, we are in uh, Sicily, and then all these characters stumble in who are as English as they can. <laughs> you know, the mechanicals and, and uh, you know, the watch in Much Ado, and they're pure England, you know. And, you know, he, I don't, he doesn't worry himself too much. I mean, obviously, in the history plays, uh, he tries to get a bit more uh, closer, but he's, he's quite happy to fiddle with events. Um, I think he... He, he just um, creates these wonderful settings uh, for which the groundlings would simply say, oh, we're out foreign. You know, we're out somewhere foreign then. Uh, and it would just be to them um, a colourful setting. Uh, and when the characters like the watch come stumbling in, uh, they're just pompous characters. They would immediately recognise from, from the towns and villages they mm. come from. Um, so I, I think um, he doesn't worry himself too much, apart from you know uh, plays like Julius Caesar, where he uh, he's got plenty of classical sources. Where he um, the, even there there are anachronisms, but they're they're much more true to their classical time. I think. Well, there's there's some certainly in Caesar where you can actually see from the source he's nicked it verbatim. Yeah. And he's, he's, yeah. he's, he's just copied out. He's obviously copied it out of a book or he's learnt it by rote when he was at school, which it was a common practice. And there's every yeah. chance that he was still retaining that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've, we've got a question, uh, another one from Randall. He says, um, it's a more natural than a social or political history, but did wolves survive in Wales longer than in other parts of Britain? So were uh, there wolves yes. um, longer? There's a, a little village near me uh, called Bledva, and it's a corruption of Blythva, which, is, which means the place of the wolf. Right. And I think the last wolf was in Wales was shot something like the 18th century or, or something like that. I th I'm pretty sure they, they lasted in Scotland uh, um, much later. But yes, they certainly did um, right up till at least the 18th century, yeah. So, don't imagine go all those country walks, which would be a bit more exciting if <laughs> yes. there's chance, just, of, yes. chance yeah. of a walk. Now, yeah. when you're encountering a play like Cymbeline and you've got an immense amount of knowledge of, of the realities of what the Celts would have been like, do, does that does it, do you find it easy or hard to switch off your historical brain and just enjoy the story? Uh, it, it's easy to switch off because as soon as you open it up, um, Shakespeare is very careful to avoid the word English or yeah. Englishman, um, but then he falls into the trap of uh, using terms like Wales, like France, both of which didn't exist at the yeah. time. Um, so, yes, I'm, I, you're aware roughly when it's set, but it's not in any sense an accurate portrayal, but it, it leaves things open enough that you can exploit vi uh, visual imagery. And um, I mean, it, you, I couldn't really say, oh, could we turn Cymbeline and its 
uh, royal family into a matrilinear. Ooh, you, that would be very, I suppose you could do it, but you'd, you'd have to do, uh, male characters would have to be female and it would get very complicated. Um, and it, it probably wouldn't work anyway. Um, as soon as you end up with uh, the recovery of the sons at the end, that would, that would all fall apart. So, um, you know, you, um, I, I don't have a vast experience of uh, being in Shakespeare plays, but I've been in enough now to, to know historical settings are a very loose framework and that you, you should regard yourself as free to do pretty well what you like, really, within reason. <laughs> so we've still got time for, for some more questions, but um, I'm wondering if there's, if, if, is there uh, a detail of history which you think is incredibly significant to kind of a Shakespeare's culture, but also our culture that you think people should be more aware of or, or it doesn't get enough, uh, as much kind of daylight as it deserves to because it's so significant? Well, I think um, most of what we knew about um, these islands in prehistoric times up to the uh, up to and beyond the Roman period has been turned on its head uh, by different sciences. Uh, so we, we always used to think that um, the great uh, uh, the great artifacts uh, the great buildings of, say, Avebury, the stone circles, the megaliths. Uh, we used to think, oh, um, the skills for that must have come from the continent. Um, we now know it's exactly the opposite, that actually the, the chronology shows that it clearly comes from Orkney and comes south. Uh, so rather than it being... Um, for example, there was a, a, a man who's known as the Amesbury Archer and his body was dug up um, and uh, through studying isotope analysis on this tooth enamel, uh, we know this man grew up uh, somewhere in France and people were saying, oh, is this the man who showed the poor British how to build Stonehenge? No, they already knew how to build Stonehenge. Um, you know, what it shows is that uh, there's always been uh, trade and travel across the whole of Europe um, that um, uh, in, indeed in prehistoric times, um, the sort of culture of uh, putting up travelers on their way through, um, the, the culture of hospitality to strangers was more important than, than ever. Uh, and the second great thing uh, which uh, we should all be aware of, really, is uh, DNA analysis. Um, this, this is still in its infancy, but um, the latest big national survey has shown some astonishing things. First of all, it's shown that um, uh, if you are English, you have Celtic ancestors, that there was no Anglo-Saxon invasion, that there was no slaughter and ethnic cleansing. Um, our Celtic ancestors are just that, they're our ancestors. Um, but it also shows, if you compare the DNA analysis of those areas we've always thought of as Celtic, Cumbria, the land of the Cymry, um, uh, the, their very name is, you know, um, the word, uh, the Cumbrogi was the original word, which has evolved into Cymry, Wales, of course, uh, which meant something like uh, fellow travellers, companions, um, fellow countrymen, something like that. Um, but if you look at Wales, uh, North Wales, South Wales, if you look at Cumbria and you look at Cornwall, the DNA there is very, very different, markedly different to the DNA patterns you find in England, mm. but it's also markedly different from each other. So the the DNA patterns in North Wales are as different uh, from South Wales as they are from the people of Iran. Wow. Uh, so what this tells us is, even though it's in the national curriculum, there is no such people as the Celts. 
Right. There are a number of people who've come to these islands and they share a culture, but they've come from different places. Uh, they share a culture, they share a language, but they're not a people in that sense. There's no bloodline, whatever. Uh, so we probably shouldn't call them the Celts, really, because that's a bit misleading. It sounds like they're a single people that came together and they're not, they're not at all. Um, I, I was interested in the... Um, uh, the DNA analysis map, which was produced uh, by the university department, because um, in England, it's much the DNA patterns are much more homogenous. And people have suggested that's probably because uh, the Roman roads were still in use and it was far easier to get about. Right. Uh, and in a time when uh, the, the sort of Celtic tribes had disappeared uh, and there were new political boundaries being set up, you could move about much more, much more easily. Uh, but I looked at the place where I grew up in West Yorkshire, and there's a peculiar little uh, pattern, a little strand of DNA that you only find in that one area um, in West Yorkshire. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the British Isles. Um, and if you map it, it exactly corresponds to the ancient kingdom of Elmet, which was a Welsh-speaking um, kingdom. Um, and when it fell to the Anglo-Saxons, they weren't driven out because we're still there. Um, this the peculiar little strand. So I, I think what this shows is a much greater continuity. Um, mm. uh, and, you know, people thinking, ah, oh, even historians even used to use the phrase, the Anglo-Saxon race. Ooh. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to go down that route at all. Um, but it's uh, even things like we should have been questioning earlier. I mean, uh, St. Bede is the great myth maker of mm -hmm. the creation of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And he talks about the creation of the kingdom of Wessex. And he says uh, it was uh, men came over in three keels, three ships, uh, and they founded the kingdom of Wessex, conquering it. Well, we know how big the keels were because we dug them up in um, the Sutton Hoo ship burials. Um, three keels is about 50 or 60 men. Uh, you can't carve out a kingdom with only 50 or 60 men. Um, and the very first two kings of Wessex, he quotes, have both got Welsh names. So... We should have been very wary about all this stuff uh, long before DNA, really, um, and been asking an awful lot more questions. So um, we, we could have got just as much wrong as Shakespeare did. <laughs> definitely, definitely, yeah. But in, in the fullness of time, um, Shakespeare isn't trying to come up with an accurate portrayal of, you know, Celtic Iron Age. He's... It's a great story, um, and he's, uh, he's really talking about uh, and celebrating people who live close to nature more than yeah. anything and away from you know, the poisonous world of the courts, uh, which they were poisonous in his day. You know, and you've only got to think of how many people were beheaded um, in the, the Tudor dynasty and yeah. right through to the Jacobean period. Yeah. So it's about connection to a land, the country that the yeah. plays are set in, yeah. um, which underneath the, the surface may have a bit more Celt and Iron Age still present than people yeah. were aware of. And on that note, I think that's a lovely place to, yeah. to round off. Well, and, uh, <laughs> we could talk for uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely hours on, on this. It's been so fascinating and mm. uh, really interesting to put it in a historical context and then kind of find the... Um, the, the limitations even with that but um thank you so much gav this has been amazing and i hope yeah, you've enjoyed it brilliant um so we've got another sharing shakespeare in two weeks time uh stand uh, stand by for announcements for who that will be with and um i hope you enjoy it as much as you've enjoyed this one but once again if everyone at home can give a round of applause to to gav <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you for giving up your evening. Um, a lot. Uh, I'm going to end the stream now, but uh, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Right. Thank you.